Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, Mariana, now we can we can start the live. Yes, estamos on. Good afternoon. Welcome to the LSST Brazil 2021. This is a two day remote meeting organized by Linea with the purpose of keeping the Brazilian community well informed about the Rubin Observatory, the LSST project, and the Brazilian Participation Group, especially regarding the upcoming new opportunities for Brazilian researchers and students in early 2022. If you are watching us live, today is December 7th. My name is Julia Chuvan. I am a data scientist at Linea, and I have the pleasure of being the chairperson for this session. Before we start, I would like to remind you that all the details about this meeting are available on the, web, on the website, lsst-brazil2021.linea.gov. Dot br. In this website, you can uh, browse and see all the information. And there is also a list of webinars available that were uh, presented over the past two years, all about LSST and Rubin. So if you go here, you can brow browse and uh, watch all these 40 webinars. They are all available at the site. Okay, so uh, this meeting is being broadcast on YouTube. So I invite you all to give a thumbs up on this video if you appreciate this initiative and subscribe to Linea's YouTube channel to receive notifications when new videos are released. The channel address is youtube.com slash Linea MCTI. Linea stands for Interinstitutional Laboratory of e Astronomy and MCTI stands for Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. If you have questions for the speakers, please ask your questions on the YouTube chat and we are going to copy them into a document. This document containing questions and answers will be available also on the event's website very soon, together with the video recordings and the presentation slides. If there is time, the organizers will select a couple of questions and I will address them to the speakers at the end of each talk. If you have questions to the organizers, please send an email to cde at linea.gov.br. Okay, so since we expect a very broad audience today, before handing the floor over to our first guest, I would like to give you a very short introduction about LSST, Linea, and BPG. LSST stands for the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, a huge project carried out by the Rubin Observatory. The Vera C. Rubin Observatory is a US-funded and Chilean-supported project. The observatory was named in honor of Vera Rubin, the discoverer of, the, of dark matter thereby celebrating the presence of women in science. The LSST is a photometric survey that will use a 8.4 meter telescope to observe 10,000 square degrees on the sky in six bands for 10 years. It will revisit the same regions every three, three days, so it will produce a 10 year time lapse of the universe. The survey, survey was planned to be at the same time wide, fast, and deep, and it will produce 500 petabyte set of image and data products. The LSST data will be a valuable resource for almost every field of astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology. Moreover, due to the size and complexity of the data set, the survey is also a powerful laboratory for computer science and artificial intelligence. 
The Brazilian Participation Group, or BPG, is already an active science collaboration, and the number of membership positions is about to increase to more than twice, from 50 to 125, including both positions for principal investigators and junior assistants. Tomorrow, we are going to have an entire section de session dedicated to learn about the Brazilian Participation Group. For more information, also visit the BPG website, bpg lsst.linea.gov.br. Besides US and Chile, many countries participate in LSST by offering in-kind contributions to obtain data rights. Brazil is on this list, thanks to the contributions offered and negotiated by Linea. And for those who don't know about Linea yet, we are a nonprofit organization to support Brazilian community to participate in big international projects by providing services like data access, computing infrastructure, science-driven software, science portals, data visualization and data analysis tools, training for early career scientists, and public outreach. You can find more about Linea on linea.gov.br. So what to expect from the day one of this meeting? Let's take a look at our schedule for today. So in the first se session, we are going to learn about the Brazilian participation from Ruben's perspective, the construction status, and the science opportunities with Ruben and LSST. And then we will have a 10 minute break. And in the second session, we are going to learn about data access at Ruben, the LSST Corporation, and last but not least, education and public outreach at Rubin. So without further ado, let's welcome our first guest, Dr. Greg Majeski from SLAC at Stanford University. So I'm going to stop, stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. Let me share my screen. This is really wonderful to hear that uh, this is going to be a very nice and very full program. So let me share this particular screen and I can go into the slideshow mode so you can see the whole, whole thing. Uh, I'm Greg Madejski and I'm at Stanford University and uh, at Slack, and I'm a member of the Rubin Observatory Community Engagement Team. And that is really basically my, uh, my goal here to, uh, uh, to tell you what we're up to and so on and so forth. Okay, so as Julia said, the Rubin Observatory is a very large 8.4 meter telescope, which has importantly very large field of view. And one of the reasons why that is very important is because it actually is designed for surveys. You can see the, uh, uh, the sketch of the telescope and also the footprint of the uh, observatory uh, sky uh, of the sky on the uh, on the slides on the left hand side uh, and you can actually see the little piece uh, a picture of the of a moon this is a telescope that has a 3.2 degree diameter about 10 square degrees worth of a uh, of solid angle on the sky and you will hear a lot more about the details of the status of the instrument and of the science goals uh from uh, from subsequent speakers the important part is that Rubin is a joint use Chilean project, but there is a number of in kind international contributions from many different countries in exchange for data rights. And Brazil is one of the most prominent uh, contributors here, certainly with the, uh, a lot of contributions that already has taken place and a lot of them that will be taking place as we go along. A lot of it is in form of software development, substantial part of it will be via the uh, independent data center that will be a uh, present, I believe, in, in Brazil, although that's still under discussion exactly what will happen there. All right, so let me just go to the next slide. And here you will see the four driving science goals for the Rubin Observatory. Uh, the four of them, uh, which are the four pillars on which the whole project is being built, is that uh, perhaps the most important goal where there is a significant um, funding coming in from the Department of Energy has to do with probing of dark matter and dark energy. And that's done via a variety of different tools, strong and weak lensing, study of large scale structure, uh, and also galaxy clusters, supernovae, and variety of other means of measuring, for instance, the, the Hubble constant and so on and so forth. 
We also are going to engage in the inventory of the solar system, and especially the small objects, the objects that are moving through space, uh, such that we can take a better inventory of exactly what's going on in, uh, in within our solar system. With the instrument having eight meters of diameter and very sensitive charge couple device type detectors, it will be very sensitive to, uh, to even very faint objects, especially the ones that are moving across the sky. We're planning to do the mapping of the Milky Way galaxy, and uh, the whole idea here is to study the evolutionary history and structure of the, of the galaxy, but not just the galaxy itself, but also the satellite gal uh, galaxies around the Milky Way. The whole idea there is to try to understand what is the evolutionary history of the interaction of those satellites. With our own uh, uh, with our own galaxy, and there will be probably a lot of additional information from both Michael Strauss and Jelko uh, in the uh, subsequent talks about some of the details. And finally, the last bit uh, is the last of the four pillars: is the exploration of the transients in the sky. It's variable stars, exploding supernovae, and so on and so forth. So the whole idea here is to try to uh, understand what is the process of the variability and discover those exploding and transient stars and perhaps follow them up with spectroscopic on other kinds of measurements. All right, um, so I wanted to point out this, this is a very busy slide and I'm not going through every detail of it, but I want to point out that Rubin Observatory is an integrated system that consists of a telescope and camera, but that's not the whole story. Of course, a very important part is this very large scale data management that has to do with the fact that the data have to be properly calibrated, they have to be properly uh, uh, referred to the uh, absolute positions on the sky and so on and so forth. So uh, basically the uh, integration here has to do with the uh, basically making sure that the data system data management is done correctly, that is done in such a way that the whole thing uh, conforms to the, uh, to the project requirements. All right, um, so now let me talk a little bit about the Rubin Science Platform, because that's really something that uh, those of you who are going to participate in this project probably will see as the, um, as the, as the, as the facing uh, um, aspect of the, of the data. The total amount of data is so enormous that it's simply not going to be possible to download the entire uh, data set from the Rubin Observatory. And therefore, the scientists will have to work next to data. In other words, instead of bringing the data to your computer, you will bring your own applications to the data system, which is the Rubin Science Platform. It's basically an integrated web-based set of applications running at the Rubin Observatory Data Access Centers. I'm saying centers is because there will be a main data access center, uh, and then there will be satellite smaller ones that will be only uh, allowing the users to perform only some limited set of functions. So the uh, Rubin Science Platform contains uh, multiple different aspects. And the two main ones are the so-called portal aspect, where you can actually explore and visualize or the Rubin archive. And then there will be a notebook aspect, which is done via Jupyter Notebooks, which is basically this data analysis by bringing in your own set of tools and accessing via a tool called the Butler data that will be sitting in the in the archive and you can actually reduce that the data that is only of interest to you rather than bring the whole thing into your um into your own computer so Rubin is organized around eight science collaborations and again as i hinted the science at uh, Rubin is going to be uh done basically by joining in those science collaborations so any of you who are at all interested in for instance something having to do with galaxies and something having to do with the uh, um, strong lensing or so, might want to uh, reach out and join those uh, science collaborations. That is actually, the science collaborations are very open. And uh, at the moment, there is really no very strict restriction that you have to have data rights to start joining into the science collaborations. Again, as Julia mentioned earlier, the total amount of the uh, uh, of the data access for the Brazilian community will be quite extensive. So you can expect that there will be a pretty large number of the uh, PI uh, slots. So the uh, science collaborations, I'm going to list them so you can actually 
identify the ones that you might be interested in, is transient and variable sources. Those are supernovae, those are uh, active galactic nuclei, or maybe even fast radio bursts if we are hoping to discover those. In those transient and variable sources, we anticipate that an important ingredient will be sources that maybe have done something else in other bands. For instance, we expect that there will be gravitational wave source follow-up there might be follow-up on the uh, um, on sources that are, for instance, gamma ray emitters, very bright, very transient gamma ray emitters. For stars, Milky Way and local volume, that's pretty straightforward. This is basically an understanding of evolution of our own Milky Way more than anything else. The largest collaboration is the dark energy science collaboration, and that is the one that is going to go after trying to understand the dark energy parameters. Uh, the whole idea there is to study the evolution of structure of the, in the universe and try to uh, infer the, uh, uh, the, the properties and evolution of dark energy. But that also includes the dark matter studies. So uh, we anticipate that there will be, it, at the moment, it is the largest collaboration, including on the well over 100 people. Then there is the solar system science collaboration. I already mentioned this. The galaxies collaboration will go after uh, um, the, sorry for the typo there, uh, we'll go after the understanding of structure of the, uh, uh, of the external galaxies. The active galaxies, uh, galactic nuclear collaboration would be more taking the, the census of active galaxies and also trying to identify the ones that, uh, that are variable and maybe trying to understand the variability of those. And finally, the strong lensing science collaboration is essentially a part of dark energy science collaboration, but there's more to it. So there would be a a fair amount of work going on, for instance, in uh, trying to measure the Hubble constant using the time delays of uh, of gravitational lens, the quasars behind the behind the uh, gravitational lenses. And finally, the last one is the informatics and statistics science collaboration, which is basically one that is in the uh, um, in sort of the support business of trying to understand how to how to do the analysis of the data. So how is this community engagement team supporting the science community to perform science at its very best? Uh, we set up the community engagement team that is focused on supporting scientists and students worldwide. It's not only for Americans, Chileans, or in-kind contributions, but everybody who is at all planning to take advantage of the, uh, of the Rubin data. Um, that includes uh, basically both senior researchers but what we really want to make sure is that the community engagement team provides an entry for the younger for the less senior uh, members of the community to be able to just engage relatively quickly so the resources that and, and activities that uh, we at the community engagement team are providing are the bi-weekly uh, assemblies of people who have signed up to uh, analyze the uh, data preview data which is the simulated data. Um, that's what I said here in the last blue uh, bullet. Um, and those are hands-on demonstrations uh, and it's all done remotely, but it's all uh, done in the uh, uh, collaborative form. So people sit maybe and discuss things and, and hear presentations and so on and so forth. Uh, we are very good in having the very extensive documentation for the uh, DP0 um, project. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm basically not extending the great uh, about uh, the discussion about DP0 is because that is you, if once you join in, you will see that we'll have the next uh, step, which will be a uh, um, data preview um, 0 0.2, where uh, we will have more opportunities for people to participate and to join in and to learn about how to analyze the data. Um, every member of the community who signs up for participation and data preview will actually be given a computer account uh, on the Rubin Science platform and can actually get there, put their hands on the data, on the simulated data, but still data that will look just like the data that we expect to be happening uh, or to be taken by the, by the instrument. Uh, so um, in the very nearest future, we are planning to, um, again, make an uh, announcement about the uh, the beginning of DP 0.2 and uh, uh, the important part here which is what I want to leave with you is that you don't have to wait until the telescope is operational you can get involved now you can learn how to use those tools and you can you know, there is actually a reason why we really like to have a broad community participation in this because we anticipate or we expect we hope for a feedback to learn what is that has to be added to the outward facing 
uh, Rubin Science Platform interface to make it easier for all of you to participate in this, to take advantage of this wonderful data set. Okay, with, at this point, without uh, much more ado, I think that there will be a lot more uh, as far as the instrument and the uh, status, of, status of the instrument and the, and the, the, antici the anticipated uh, data uh, from other speakers. So uh, let me stop sharing and uh, um, I will be very happy to answer any questions if anybody has anything. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. Please, uh, if you have questions to Greg, please post it in the chat and we are going to re redirect it to him. Uh, well, I don't see any questions for now, but I, uh, let, just to let you know uh, again, uh, the, the, the questions would be posted in a Google Doc and will be posted later on uh, together with the answers in, the, in our website. So I think we can move on to the next speaker, which is Dr. Jelko Ivesic from the University of Washington. Dr. Izbezic, can you hear me? Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. So the main message coming from this talk will be that the Rubin Observatory construction is almost completed. LSST is bound to happen. We'll start in a bit over two years from now. And most importantly for people in Brazil, the time to start serious preparations for doing science with LSST data is now. So even though there are still two years to go, I will show you in some slides that there will be a lot of opportunities to get up to speed using extant data simulations prior to data release one from LSST. And these details and some other details that I put in slides, you can download. Here is the link for this talk for these slides. There will be some busy slides that I intentionally included, even though I'm not going to dwell too deeply on them, but they may be useful to you later. So I'll talk about three topics. I will first show you some brief introduction to the concept and then most of my talk will be about the construction status of the observatory itself. I'll show you some pretty photographs that will illustrate where we stand right now and what is left to be done. And then I'll comment at the end with a few slides on what are we doing to prepare for operations, both as an observatory and also to prepare our stakeholders, our scientists for operation space when you will be busy using our Rubin Science platform and doing science. Many of these slides I borrowed from my colleagues. <laughs> I'll give them back once I'm done here. So this is my intro slide when I talk to people who are not astronomers to explain to them what is the place of Rubin Observatory and LSST survey in the overall global context of optical astronomy or optical infra, near infrared, if you will. So we have two space telescopes, James Webb and Nancy Roman telescope that are successors to the Hubble Space Telescope, one with much larger mirror, that's James Webb. And the other one has almost exactly the same mirror as Hubble, but it has about 100 times larger field of view. And because of that, it will be 100 times faster in observing the sky, especially if you want to do survey like things like Cosmos survey, you could do 100 times larger area in the same amount of time or 100 times faster. This concept of either going deeper or going to a larger field of view is also followed on the ground. And on the left, you can see three ground-based telescopes. And of course, you in Brazil are familiar with one of them. And so these three big telescopes are trying to make ever bigger mirrors and to go deeper per unit time. While the main reason for Rubin Observatory is a large combination of a large mirror and field of view, because that product determines how quickly you can scan the sky. And so as Greg already said, 
this observatory was designed to be a survey instrument and it was named after Vera as Greg already discussed. So the basic concept is quite simple. You have this large field of view, 10 square degrees. Per night, you can obtain on average close to 1,000 such observations, standard observations that have 30 seconds exposure time. So you can cover about 10,000 square degrees per night. So that's a huge chunk of the observable sky. And so after 10 years, with the strategy that we have, we'll observe the sky close to 1,000 times, about half the sky. And so more precise numbers can be found in our science requirements document. And each of these circles on the sky will contain about 10 million galaxies. That's how you get to billions and billions of galaxies. So I will not dwell too much here because Greg already counted, but there are four main science themes that have been defined more than a decade ago. They withstood the test of time. Key point is that they will all utilize the same data set. There will be no time allocation committee for the majority of observing time at Rubin Observatory. And I'll get back to that point later when I give you more details about the survey, a more detailed discussion of the progress in science that LSST data will enable will be presented by Mark Michael in his talk after this one. So basic concept is to cover the sky in six bands, very similar to SDSS bands, very similar to dark energy survey bands that you are familiar with. So it's U, G, R, I, Z, Y. Z and Y in LSST are almost the same as Z band in SDSS. So it's, it's almost the same wavelength range. As I said, we'll have 10 year survey that will obtain about thousand observations when summed over all bands on the sky. That's why we call it digital color movie of the sky often in our propaganda talks. It will be close to 100 petabytes of raw imaging data. When processed with everything else, metadata, it will be about 500 petabytes data set. And we expect that we will detect in quite data about 40 billion objects, about half of them will be galaxies and half of them will be stars. That will be first time in history that astronomers will have cataloged more objects on the sky than there are living people on earth hasn't happened yet, that will be the first time. So we are still in the process of optimizing our observations. This is our, an old baseline where you can see in green, the main survey, and then some additional parts of the sky that are covered with different cadence. And this is now work in progress. We still plan to spend next calendar year to further optimize exact strategy that we will use to start the survey. And then of course, as the survey progresses, we will be tracking progress and perhaps modify further once we understand performance of the system much better. And just to amuse you a little bit, here is animated GIF from one of our cadence simulations. So it's, there's no time allocation committee. It's a mathematical algorithm that encodes what we think we need to do is to maximize astronomical science. So there is reward function. There is also cost function, how long it takes to slew to the next spot. Then depending on observing conditions, you want to choose different bands or different locations on the sky. And so it automatically happens. And every 40 seconds on average, we get to the new field of view. So just to illustrate the quality of data, this is an image from SDSS that you are all familiar with. It's a teeny tiny part of the sky. It's about one tenth of the full moon's diameter. And this is the same area on the sky observed by Subaru's HSC to roughly the same depth as LSST coded data. So let me flip. So you can see what is the progress when you go from SDSS to LSST across half the sky, LSST area will be 5 million times larger than this image. And so as you go deeper, you get more objects. And that's why we will end up with 40 billion objects in LSST survey. And so now let me talk a little bit about construction. So I have a little video clip about 1.5 minutes to give you a quick summary of what happened since the beginning of the construction project to now, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. The 
this is done with drone. If you didn't know, Rubin Observatory has its own Air Force. We have two drones, LSST-1 and LSST-2. That's how we make these amazing video clips and photographs. At some point, about two years ago, finishing the dome was a major challenge. But fortunately, it's almost done now, and it will be formally done in less than a year. You can see the moment when the top assembly on telescope was added. Let's see. Hang on a second. There we go. And so this is status now as of a few weeks ago. You can see that building is by and large completed. The dome is by and large completed. Telescope is in there, still without optics. And so the main goal for the next year will be to install optics and then to continue with measurements on the sky by commissioning camera and then by the main camera. So that's that moment when the telescope mount assembly was essentially completed by adding the the top assembly, that ring on top. That's the photograph from inside the dome. You can see telescope on the left pointing to Zenit. And now let me show you a couple of photographs from the camera. About a year ago, this, uh, this uh, focal plane was completed. It was fully paved with CCDs. This is a bit older photograph where I wanted to show how these rafts were being installed in the camera. It's a very slow process. Tolerances are just few microns, so it goes with a special robotic hand, and it's it's very carefully designed not to have CCDs touch each other. This is the focal plane at the end. So there are 189 4K by 4K CCDs. There are two types of CCDs. I'll show you a slide later. And this is one of the first images that were obtained with our main camera. That's the image that Greg showed of Vera working on, on her radial velocity measurements. So there are two types. We had to use two vendors because initially we wanted to see which one would be better, but then in the end it turned out that neither of them could deliver the required number of CCDs. So we had to resort to two. On the right, you can see differences in their QE curves. Most of the difference is in G and R band. And before you start worrying about calibration of this data, uh, this difference between the two types of sensors is much smaller than the difference in overall throughput that is induced by the variations of the atmosphere and by the variation of air mass of your pointing. So this is not a problem to see these differences between the two. Indeed, it opens up opportunities for various systematics analysis where we just use data from one sensor and you ask if you get the same scientific conclusion from the data set that is based on the other sensors. Because again, we will have in each band hundreds of observations so you can play these games. We also have six filters delivered and accepted. Here you can see examples of some of them. They are quite large. In this box, there are two of them, but just a couple of weeks ago, all six of them were stored in this box and waiting for being shipped to Chile. So essentially, we have all the hardware in hand, and most of the hardware is actually already at the summit. And so what remains to be done is integration of all the components and then commissioning of the system. Here are photographs from clean room at Slack, where the camera, main camera was assembled. You can see on the left, cryostat being lifted, and then it was uh, mated with the heart of the camera in the middle. And we are now in the process of electro-optical testing where we are trying to do as many measurements as we can accomplish given the schedule that will later help us full rate observations with this camera. This is now the summit. This is one of the floors of that big building at the summit. This, this uh, instrument is what we call commissioning camera. From the outside, it has the same dimensions as the main camera. It also has the same weight. 
uh, when another piece is added. So it can be used to test many aspects of camera installation. And it has one raft. What, what we call a raft is this three by three CCDs, nine CCDs, that is essentially an independent camera. It has all the electronics underneath CCDs. So they can be replaced. If something happens, you can replace them. And so one of these will be tested when we start using this ComCam commissioning camera on Sky. And that is supposed to happen early in 23. So roughly speaking about a year from now, this ComCam is supposed to be installed on the telescope and start obtaining images of the sky that will look like this lab image on the right. That's in about a year from now. Here are a few more photographs. You can see M2 secondary mirror surrogate version in the back on the left. You can see M1, M3 surrogate on the right, this white big uh, circular disc. And then far in the back on the right, you can see the, the dome of the coating chamber where we will be regularly recoating these mirrors. And then finally, the, the last main component in addition to telescope and the camera is software. And as Greg already mentioned, our goal is not just to produce these images, but to fully calibrate them and then to run software pipelines that will find objects that will measure their properties and that will also do two approaches to data analysis, one based on co-editing images so that you go deeper and the other one based on image differencing so that you find everything that changed on the sky. And so the results of these measurements, what we call data products, they will be served to users through LSSD science platform that Greg already mentioned. And you'll learn more about this from Vilo Moulin. So it's not just images, but it's science ready data products that are served to users in a way that will enable efficient science production. So there will be three types of data products. Every night we will measure objects found in image differences. And within 60 seconds of closing the shutter, there will be an alert stream that will tell you what we found, including measurements and postage stamps of those objects. And you can subscribe to that stream via brokers, and then you can deploy your additional facilities in a follow-up. Roughly once per year, we will have data releases that will be very similar to data releases of other surveys, such as Dark Energy Survey and SDSS. And then there will be also a set of tools at our data center where you will be able to use them or write additional software and apply it to data set that will be available at our data center without having to download them to your home computer. And then you will be able to federate your data products with others. And so that's what we call user-generated data products. This link tells you many more details about what exactly we will measure, what will be our schema for the measurements, what kind of data you can expect to get from our science pipelines. And of course, then we'll tell you even more. I'll just go through a few quick slides with, with the camera and the telescope. I can show you pretty photographs <laughs> and you can gauge how far we got with construction. With software, of course, it's a bit harder. So. I will show you a few slides that demonstrate that we think we are in good shape. So this is just symbolic scheme of what our software does. You feed it images and additional metadata such as calibration data, external catalogs. Then there are complicated pipelines in the middle and what you get out are catalogs, catalogs of different data structures and delivered on different timescales as I just went through on previous slide. And so if you unpack this box with pipelines, one level down, you can logically divide it into about eight different pipelines. Number one is what we typically think of a software pipeline for astronomical surveys. That would be, for example, SDSS software would fit in that number one, but there is much more that we will be doing in Rubin Observatory. And it comes in two flavors. There is this yearly data release based on co-edited images on the left. 
and then daily processing that includes image differencing and then alert production, but also very exquisite solar system object pipelines, et cetera, that's on the right. We have about 80 people, maybe 90 working in data management, about 20, 25 are in science pipelines. The rest of people are providing infrastructure. So science pipelines are being done at Princeton and University of Washington. There are many more people than on this, uh, than on this slide. And they are using existing data as well as simulations to test the status of pipelines. It's done effectively every day. There is continuous integration and testing of the pipelines. So on the left, you can see simulations. There is quite exquisite set of images that are simulated LSST data set that you can already access. I'll tell you a little bit more in a second. And then we are also reprocessing dark energy camera data and uh, HSC data from the Subaru telescope. And so based on this, uh, where is my image? Oh, here it is. So we also have auxiliary telescope that is used for calibration. And we are already processing those data too. And those data are obtained with the same devices as the other two cameras will have. So this is the third instrument that we have at the observatory. And here is just one slide showing progress with image differencing. If you work in this field, you may remember, for example, PainStar's data that had huge rate of false positives that worried us a lot at Rubin Observatory if we are going to be able to beat it down. And so we are already demonstrating that with, with more exquisite software and somewhat better camera and dark energy camera, we managed to push this false positive ratio from about 100 to one, if not worse, down to four to one. And that's even without any, any uh, AI learning and classification that we can put on top of this. So we are feeling fairly good about performance of these pipelines. We don't have everything we need yet. We still have two years of construction and we cannot meet all the specs at this moment. But I think we already know robustly that there will be no catastrophic failures because of science pipelines. Uh, EPO is another important component of the system. We are lucky that Lorraine will give you excellent talk later. So I will not go into details. I just want to use EPO as an example of something that will be done before the formal start of operations. So, we, as we finish things, we basically declare them done. And we already have data processing center in Chile, for example, in La Serena, that was finished and delivered to, to operations team. The same is true with, um, with EPO that will be finished by the end of this year and you, you'll get many more details later. So let me talk a little bit about schedule. And this is our all hands meeting in Tucson picture of the team, about 150 people from 2019. And then of course, as you know, we all changed the way we are working. So the following year we couldn't travel. So it was a Zoom-based all hands meeting. And because of COVID, our schedule slipped. So close to two years. And it is a dashed, if you see, you see my cursor. So this dashed parts, this is basically what was stretched out because of COVID problems. So essentially we lost, we lost close to two years. And this, uh, this uh, greenish box on the right tells you the most important piece of information that right now we think that if everything goes well, so the best case scenario, we would be done with construction in January of 24. We are still carrying scheduled reserve and so what we call late finish, if when we spend all this schedule reserve would be June 24. So we give you a window between June, between January and June of 24 as the completion of construction and beginning of operations. Even though in practice, it will not be a step function. As we finish more and more things, we are going smoothly into more and more operations like mode of working and our observatory is already operational effectively because we are getting data with Oxtel 
We are, pro we are shipping those data to our processing center in US. We are basically operating already as a live observatory. So 19 months was the impact. And so let me just say a few words about commissioning. During commissioning, we will be getting very interesting data, culminating with two months of what we hope will be science quality data. And these two months of, of Rubin Observatory data is even a bit more than dark, complete dark energy survey. So it's non-trivial data set. And it will be excellent to get up to speed to be ready for data release one from Rubin Observatory. And so we will have our early operations team is already producing data releases that they call data previews. The first one is based, or they call it zero. Zero to one is based on simulated data. Number one will be based on data with commissioning cam and DP2 that will be available in about a year and a half from now, hopefully will provide essentially a data set equivalent to dark energy survey. So now is the time to start preparing. And here is more detailed schedule for the remaining work that I put. Just if you're really interested in gory detail, there are people who would like to participate in commissioning and there are ways to do it, to join the team. So I just put this for information purposes. And now let me show you a few slides about operations. So we already have early operations team. We do have director and deputy directors. They are preparing the teams. They just finished a giant proposal that will go to NSF for funding for the first five years of Rubin Observatory and LSSD. That's non-trivial proposal. It's about $300 million. So there was a lot of work by this team. So that's how it will work in operations. There will be, there will be three main parts of the observatory. There will be observatory operations that will be producing images. Then there will be data production that will be running pipelines and producing data products. And then there will be system performance department that will track the survey progress, that will engage with community, that will optimize survey scheduling, etc. And to give you an idea about how large is that operation going to be at the peak, operations will have about 160 people. It's funded 50-50 between National Science Foundation and Department of Energy. And you will learn more from Will Omulain about data processing centers and what exactly will they do. I just added a few slides here to give you a flavor of what they are doing. So in construction, most of construction period, we had NCSA uh, close to Chicago, National Center for Supercomputing Applications being our data processing center. But once the federal government decided that funding was supposed to be 50-50 between DOE and NSF, then data processing center was shifted to Slack lab, and that's where we are going to do it. Indeed, it will be a hybrid data center where some of the processing will be done or data serving will be done in the cloud and will will tell you more about this. So as part, and now comes the important thing for you, as part of this early operations preparation, we already have live data previews. And in particular, data preview 0 0.1 is already available. And the processing with up-to-date pipelines is now going on. And in by next summer, data preview 0 0.2 will be available, which will be still simulated data, but processed with much more advanced pipelines. And you can go there, you can get various Python notebooks that show you how to access data, that show you examples of, of scientific analysis you could do. And I went through all of them. And the first impression was, this is fantastic stuff. Second impression was, this is not trivial. <laughs> there is a lot of stuff to learn in order to be efficient user of these data products. And that's why I'm telling you now is the time to start preparing. Here is the schedule of these data previews. So as I said, 01 is already available, 02 is coming up, and then DP1, DP2 will be based on real data. First one from ComCam, second one from the main LSSD camera. And then in data product column, 
you can see what each of these data previews will include. And if these names in data product column make no sense to you, you can then go to the previous document that I referred, data products definition document, DPDD, and then you can match descriptions in that document with these titles in here. Again, bottom line, first real data from our camera, ComCam, will be released to you in about less than two years. So let me stop here, let me summarize. So the main message is Rubin Observatory is almost completed. LSST is bound to happen. We hope to start operations in a bit more than two years from now. And the time for getting ready to use our data products and become efficient user of data products is now. Don't think it's too early. There is a lot of stuff to be learned and you are doing good thing by organizing these meetings for your community and trying to get your community to prepare itself. So I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ivesic. So we have two questions. Uh, first is about the filters from Professor Basilio Santiago. Are there empirical filter transmission functions already available or just expected ones? We do have measured transmission functions. It's all public. We also have all the other components of the system that you need to have in order to compute overall throughput of the system. And it's all publicly available together with tools that can be used, for example, to take spectral energy distributions from your simulations, for example, of galaxies or stars or whatever. And you can convolve them with these throughputs and you can predict Colo Colo tracks in LSST, Colo Colo diagrams, for example. Thank you. And the last question is from Miguel Quartin uh, and says, from what I hear there, there has been an intense debate on the survey strategy, especially on the cadence in much of the footprint. Is there a target deadline to finalize the main survey strategy? Yes, that's an excellent question. I would say that word intense is the right one, but I would take it with positive sign. <laughs> it's cadence diplomacy that we are doing, not cadence wars. Yeah, so yes, there is an external committee called Survey Cadence Optimization Committee, and we are working hard on doing the final optimization of the survey strategy. And we are just about to release, deadline is December 15th, the first phase recommendation to the operations director. And we already produced over 100 different ways of execute LSSD. They are all publicly available together with tools to analyze them from the point of view of your particular science, if you're interested in. And by the end of the next calendar year, by December 15th, 22, we will freeze the baseline strategy. And that's what we will be using in the first months or years of the main survey. And as we gather data, then we will revisit and see if the survey is progressing as we hoped for, if the system performs as we hoped for, and if not, then we will do adequate modifications. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you and, for inviting me. And let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Mike, Michael Strauss from Princeton University. Dr. Strauss, yeah, we can see Thank your you. screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Like you, can, you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, wonderful. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to speak to all of you in Brazil. I have many colleagues and friends in Brazil and I send, send uh, best wishes. So I was asked uh, to speak uh, broadly about uh, the science opportunities within Rubin. I think many of the themes that I will discuss uh, have already been uh, touched upon by both Greg and Jaco, uh, but hope, hopefully I can add just a, a little bit more. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Michael Strauss. I'm at Princeton University and I uh, have been involved with the Rubin Observatory for many years, uh, and I currently chair the Science Advisory Committee. And in the presentation that you're uh, about to see, um, I've borrowed from many from many uh, colleagues, uh, and in particular, Federica Bianco, who uh, is a coordinator of the science collaborations. We'll hear, 
uh, we'll hear about that, and from the science collaboration chairs themselves. Oops, here we are. So um, this is probably um, somewhat redundant to what we've already heard, but it's worth reminding ourselves um, what wide field imaging can do. And as we, the astronomical community, the worldwide astronomical community think about what are the most important science questions that we wish to address for the next decade. And here in the US, we have recently gone through uh, what's called the decadal survey, which is sort of a formal process where we try to identify what the most important science questions are. What a theme that keeps on coming up over and over again is that we need deep, wide field, multiband optical imaging, uh, repeating, uh, observing large areas of the sky repeatedly. And uh, there are many examples of that when we look at, uh, wanna do a variety of cosmological studies using uh, large scale distribution of galaxies, looking at the weak lensing to measure the distribution of dark matter, looking at the properties of supernovae, uh, all different ways uh, to probe our cosmology. All of those require this wide field imaging. When we want to understand the structure of our own Milky Way galaxy, we're asking for a global distribution of stars and the, and the properties of those stars and their motions. Again, uh, wide field imaging is what we need. Uh, the variable universe and the transient universe is something, is a, is a major astronomical theme that's becoming ever more important as we discover new categories of, of uh, uh, variable objects and learn uh, fundamental new astrophysics from them. And again, to do that, one needs to cover large amounts of sky and do, do so repeatedly. Understanding the evolution with cosmic time of galaxies and quasars. Um, again, we find ourselves wanting to go very deep and uh, to measure uh, with, with high accuracy and great precision, uh, the photometric and um, morphological properties of, of the objects that we see. Uh, when we study the, the, the nature of, of our solar system and we fundamental new discoveries about uh, both the main belt asteroids and the, the outer solar system and trying to understand how that, what that tells us about the formation of the planets and the dynamics uh, in, in there. Again, wide field imaging is needed. And as a point that Jelko has made is that one can address all these questions and more um, with a survey that can be used, a single survey can, can allow us to cover all of these things. And that's really what the legacy survey of space and time really is about. So you've already heard this from Jelko, but there are four broad science themes. And it's worth saying that these science themes were developed uh, not to, list all, all, everything that the Rubin Observatory may be able to do, but rather to, under, to design a system that can do at least this, that then can enable a, a wide range of other topics. So we've already touched upon this. We would like to understand the properties of dark matter and dark energy and measure the properties uh, to, to uh, exquisite precision. Again, with tools such as uh, weak lensing, supernovae, large scale structure, and others. We want to understand the variable universe. There's a, again, an increasing understanding uh, of the richness of phenomenology out there and uh, facilities currently uh, underway are, are um, discovering an enormous range of new phenomena that we hadn't quite appreciated before. And the discovery space is, is broad and, and we want to see all the different um, types of variability and tra transient phenomena that we might be able to explore. We want to, again, understand the structure of the Milky Way galaxy and understand uh, what that tells us about its formation and therefore more generally what it tells us about galaxies forming uh, overall. And again, the solar system, uh, asteroids and comets mapping them out. So again, these are four themes that allow us to think about what the Rubin Observatory has to be able to do and what how to design the legacy survey of space and time, how to design the cadence, which came up in the questions just now. I'll touch upon those questions as well. But it's worth keeping in mind that this is not everything that Ruben will do. And I'm sure you can all think of many other science themes that, uh, that a survey that can address all these questions can also um, address uh, perhaps your own favorite scientific questions uh, that uh, may not be listed here. So um, it's worth putting this in a little bit of historical context. The Rubin uh, 
legacy survey of space and time, it builds upon uh, uh, many predecessors uh, and, and former surveys. And it's worth sort of reminding ourselves um, what the capabilities of those previous and ongoing surveys might be uh, and, and put it into the um, Rubin context. So um, this is far from a complete list. And I apologize if your favorite survey or telescope is not listed here. Uh, but uh, at, um, indeed, Jelko and I know each other from working on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that, as you probably know, is a two and a half meter telescope still in operation. Uh, the imaging component of that survey was, a was covered roughly 15,000 square degrees in uh, five, five broad bands, U, G, R, I, Z. And so we'll see uh, Ruben uses a similar filter set uh, with one more uh, Y filter. Um, there, the uh, sky was observed in those five bands to a depth, at least in the R band, of about 22 and a, and a half. And most of the sky was observed a single time. There's a single exposure over, over that, that full range. Uh, the dark energy survey, which I imagine many of you are involved in, on the Blanco four meter in Chile, uh, it's covering about 5,000 square degrees in uh, five filters, a slightly different uh, set of filters, uh, going to a depth of about 24 and a half. And again, uh, most of the uh, emphasis there is, uh, on, um, is, is on the static sky. And uh, although it's repeat observations, um, um, there the, the uh, intent is to go to a depth of roughly this, and the depths I'm quoting are roughly um, five sigma point source depths, something like um, 24 and a half. Uh, Hyper Supreme Cam, which Jelko briefly mentioned, mentioned it's a, it's a um, wide field imaging camera on the Subaru 8.2 meter telescope. It has uh, actually just completing uh, um, a 330 night survey uh, in five filters, G, R, I, Z, Y, covering about 1200 square degrees. Uh, to a depth of 26th magnitude, going a, say a magnitude and a half fainter than uh, the dark energy survey over somewhat smaller area of sky. Uh, this is starting to get to depths that are that are uh, comparable to the um, comparable to the depth of the um, LSST. And it's worth mentioning here um, that the seeing uh, in in this survey is about uh, points, point 0.6 uh, arc seconds in the I band, um, and that. Uh, we'll see similar numbers for LSST. Uh, SDSS, I should have put it on here, the SDSS was considerably worse about between 1.2 and 1.4 arc seconds, uh, quite a bit lower. And then uh, the Zwicky transient facility using the, uh, the 48 inch Schmidt telescope at Palomar, there the focus is not going deep. Uh, uh, imaging is done to about 24 20.5, mostly in the G and R band, but repeated observations over a very large area of sky. And there the emphasis is on discovering uh, new transient phenomena and variable objects of all sorts. So again, this is far from a complete list of all the, the relevant uh, wide field imaging surveys um, that, that are in existence, but really set the intellectual background and, and framework and, and inspiration uh, for, for, uh, for Rubin. So the Rubin is really a unified survey, um, as I've said, said allowing a, a broad range of science go goals. Um, this is repeating what I said, that single imaging data set, which we'll describe in just a moment, can be used to study really everything from near, near Earth asteroids to the nature of dark energy. And um, so uh, the question came up about the filter set here. I think, Shelko, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I pulled this off of our of our website, I believe this is as as uh, delivered uh, uh, filter curves uh, in U, G, R, I, Z, and Y. Those are the the uh, uh, filter filter plus atmosphere plus uh, inst instrument throughputs, assuming an air mass uh, of one point two. And again, as Jelko okay. said, uh, these are available uh, on the website. Uh, and um, so the, comparing those, those surveys that I talked about before with, the, uh, with Rubin, uh, the telescope itself has an, uh, it, its full diameter of the primary mirror is 8.4 meters, but the effective aperture with the, um, with the there's a large tertiary mirror uh, built into the primary, the effective aperture is 
is that of a of a of a um, circle with a diameter of 6.7 meters. Uh, the telescope itself is named after Charles Simonier, who who contributed uh, a large quantity large uh, quantity of funds uh, to cast that that primary mirror. I mentioned the six broad bands and the imaging depth uh, takes us to about um, 24.7 in R in each uh, ex uh, 30 second exposure, uh, what we call a visit. Um, and there's much discussion about exactly how those exposures will be take place. But think of uh, the, this 9.6 square degrees imaging an area of sky repeatedly. Um, and in each of those exposures, if it's in the R band, 24.7 and uh, similar values in the other bands. And uh, the, our best understanding of them, we'll, we'll see what the, what the um, telescope actually delivers, but we anticipate a median seeing, I think this is a number quoted in the R or the I band of about 0.7 arc seconds. So um, Jelko had already touched upon this. The full survey per footprint is, is, is essentially the entire uh, southern hemisphere, uh, roughly 20,000 square degrees. I'll show again some plots that Jelko had shown, uh, showing you what that footprint is. Most of the focus is on, on high galactic latitudes, low galactic extinction, but of course, um, there's lots of science to be done at low galactic latitudes as well, and uh, that is a, another component. We'll, we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, over most of that footprint, and Jelko quoted this number as well, uh, each field will be observed about 800 somewhere between 800 and 1,000 times over that 10-year that, uh, process. That's, that is observe, observe, observations uh, summed over the, the six different filters. And um, when one models uh, how deep this will go, these are the numbers. These are PSF five sigma um, depths uh, for each of the different fil fields. And you can see, for example, in the R band, one's getting to 27 and a half magnitude, which is um, over 20,000 square degrees. This is an astonishing depth, um, a depth that existing telescopes can do, but over really over, over limited areas. And it, with 20,000 square degrees, not only do you get far more data than we're used to, but it's really qualitatively different data. And that's, uh, you know, what one is in a, in a really a new regime when it's thinking about the science. So um, um, you've heard this phrase already, this combination of the large étendue, that is the combination of the wide field of the telescope and the large area of the primary mirror. And the fact that it's a dedicated telescope, that is this telescope is being used for nothing other than the survey, means that the survey can really be wide covering a large area. Fast, that is be able to take, look for um, transient phenomena on a variety of timescales with repeat observations and deep, in each of those exposures. So wide, fast, deep is a phrase that we find ourselves constantly using over and over again to, to, to describe the strengths of this, of this facility. So that is wide, fast, deep allows all this thing covering, I think I'm repeating myself, one can go cover a large, a large fraction of the sky, do so uh, in the time do, domain, do really deep and accurate, where we're really an emphasis on precision and uh, not just get, not just getting large quantities of data, but we want high quality, well calibrated data in each uh, uh, epoch. And of course, when with repeated imaging, then one can stack the data and go really very faint. So um, uh, Greg already made mention of this. There are eight science collaborations. Um, these logos that you see on the right, um, which I think Greg showed as well, uh, Fed Bianco, who uh, in addition to her uh, astronomical skills uh, as uh, skills as a graphic artist, and she she designed these uh, symbols that you'll see uh, going through here. And what I'm going to do now is is tell you a little bit about the science collaborations and uh, and and some of their activities. And it's worth emphasizing that the science collaborations are um, are open uh, uh, for uh, members to join, of depending on what your science areas are. Um, I think Greg has already read through the list of these science collaborations, but I will emphasize again that uh, Rubin Observatory Science is, is broad enough that um, we really do not, you do not have to, um, you, one can imagine many uh, interesting science opportunities beyond uh, what's limited here. Uh, and so one need not be limited 
uh, necessarily by, by the uh, areas that are shown here. So science collaborations, this is just a tabulation of the numbers of members of, of these different uh, science collaborations. Uh, the dark energy science collaboration uh, is, is the largest, 230 full members plus an almost 800 associate members one becomes full member after you have contributed a certain amount to the activities of the, of the science collaboration. So um, I should uh, mention that, that you know, as Jelko has emphasized, the, um, the construction and the operations, uh, the funding for that has come uh, largely from the US National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Um, I mentioned the, the, uh, the large and generous gift uh, early in the project from the Charles Simoni, uh, and then the, uh, the contribution uh, from, from Chile, which of course is uh, supplying the site and, and international partners, including Brazil. Um, but it, it's worth emphasizing that the, um, while the Department of Energy supports the defense efforts of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, the science collaborations otherwise are largely aut autonomous and are, um, are working um, largely um, independently, although in, at, at some level coordinated with the, um, the Rubin uh, project. Uh, and there's uh, a series of, of grant um, programs and Jenna Sokolowski, I think is going to touch upon some of those in her presentation uh, later today. So um, I, let me just spend a few moments uh, just describing at a very high level uh, some of the activities of each of the science collaborations. Um, these slides are a combination of slides that the science collaboration uh, chairs themselves have developed and, and things that I've pulled together. Uh, and I won't be able to talk through all of them. The dark energy science collaboration as its name implies is sort of all aspects of, of modern cosmology. Uh, and it's worth emphasizing this bullet near the middle here. What are the cosmological probes that, um, that the Rubin Observatory will allow? studies of clusters of galaxies, the large-scale uh, distribution of galaxies, large-scale structure, supernovae uh, as a standard candle to, to um, study uh, the Hubble diagram at, at high redshift, gravitational weak lensing to, to study the distribution of dark matter, and gravitational strong lensing uh, to do detailed uh, measurements of, um, for example, uh, time delays in gravitationally lensed quasars. And uh, again, this is the largest of the science collaboration uh, collaborations. And as they emphasize, when one is not limited by st statistics with the enormous data set that Rubin will produce, but it's all about systematics and, and minimizing those to understanding and then minimizing the st uh, systematics. And so it's an enor enormous effort that, that's underway. Um, Jelko made reference to the, um, to the, um, where I have it here somewhere, they've pr produced a uh, simulated data uh, that is, is used um, both by the Dark Energy Science Collaboration and other science collaborations to explore a wide range of, of different science areas, testing the pipelines and, and pr preparing uh, their communities uh, to, to do science. Transients and variable stars, um, it, you can see that's an incredibly broad range. They're uh, studying uh, the extragalactic universe, uh, all kinds of um, questions of supernovae, tidal disruption events, variability in, in quasars, uh, um, and then galactic sources, um, um, uh, repeating variables, um, Cepheids and Aurelaris, uh, binary stars, eclipsing binaries, uh, microlensing, an enormous range of different topics. Uh, I believe they have something like 13 different um, working groups within the science collaboration to explore uh, everything. Um, this this um, schematic on the right right side shows that there's an, an there's an enormous um, richness of different areas uh, under under the um, general rubric of transient and variable science. Stars, Milky Way and local volume is all about the Milky Way galaxy, the physics of the stars, stu uh, doing stellar populations in, in nearby galaxies uh, that are resolved um, that with uh, the repeat observations of LSST, one gets, um, one gets uh, excellent astrometry and proper motions. I didn't put up numbers here for parallaxes, but for the nearest stars, 
within 300 parsecs, and we'll get parallax measurements as well, going considerably fainter uh, than Gaia. And in fact, uh, at Gaia's faint end, um, Re Ruben and Gaia have similar uh, precisions for, for both proper motions and, um, and for uh, parallaxes. Uh, and um, this list of working groups gives a sense of the range of different topics that, that they're uh, actively working on. And there's much, much more work to be done there. The Solar System Science Collaboration, uh, these are numbers uh, that are maybe slightly dated. So uh, it's perhaps, it's pr these may not be the latest numbers, but here are estimates of the number of asteroids uh, of different types, uh, near Earth as I typo there. Five million um, main belt asteroids, whoops, sorry, main belt asteroids, 100,000 near Earth asteroids, Trojan asteroids, trans-Neptunian objects. These are estimates of, of, what the, of how many objects for which we will get um, orbits from, from Rubin Obser Observatory, six-band photometry, and, and further characterization. Um, and so there's a huge range of, of different topics to explore there. Um, questions of, of activity in the asteroid and, and uh, comet population. Um, there is, um, how, how does one determine those orbits? Uh, what is the optimal way to do that? How does that relate to the cadence? Those are all questions that the Solar System Science Collaboration is working closely with the project to explore. Galaxy Science Collaboration, uh, it, the estimate is that uh, at the end of the survey, um, Ruben will have discovered 20 billion galaxies. I think, um, as Jelko said, that's more than the number of human beings on Earth. Um, many different uh, questions to ask of those. One of the key um, themes within the Galaxy Science Collaboration is studying the low surface brightness universe, looking at the low, uh, the low surface brightness outskirts of galaxies, looking for the low surface brightness galaxy population itself. How does one measure photometric redshifts? optimal ways of measuring uh, spectral energy distributions. Uh, how does one measure photo um, morphologies? The image on the right is, is an image from the uh, hyper Prime cam, just a few tens of square degrees. What uh, this is uh, imaging going to roughly the LSST full depth, although over much, much, much smaller area of sky. And it, you know, when one goes at, at high galactic latitudes, the faint universe, it's all, it's all about the galaxies and uh, one sees the richness of the data that one, one will have. Uh, active galactic nuclei are um, um, exploring the properties of, of, of this subclass of galaxies, but there's a huge range of different, different science to do. do. Um, the prediction is that um, Rubin will identify of order 10 million uh, active galactic nuclei of various sorts selected in a variety of ways. This is a good point to mention uh, what are called the deep dil drilling fields, uh, the pointings of the Rubin Observatory where we will uh, observe with a higher cadence and uh, in, with the stack data going deeper. And there's a, it's of interest to all the science collaborations that the AGN science collaboration is particularly interested in gathering multi-wavelength data and using the variability information, for example, to select AGN. The Strong Lensing Science Collaboration, it's, a, it's uh, studying all aspects of, of the gravitational lenses that uh, Ruben will find. Um, estimates are up to 100,000 lenses that will be uh, described. There's a huge range of different science uh, that's outlined here. I'm getting a little close in time, so I'm going to not read through this all. And then the, the last of the science collaborations to mention is a, a slightly different one, the Informatics and Statistics Science Collaboration um, which is uh, really focused on modern uh, machine learning and AI techniques to, to, do, to do science and really is, is working with all the other science collaborations as the graphic on the right shows uh, to uh, explore um, me methodologies, interesting algorithmic questions and various things. Um, so um, that is a, a separate science collaboration of its own. So just a few themes uh, moving forward. Uh, and um, it's one of the things that we, the Rubin Observatory community is thinking about is, okay, um, we'll make all these wonderful discoveries. What, what um, facilities do we need to follow up and understand the discoveries that are made? For example, 
follow-up observations of variable or moving objects uh, become very important for many different science areas. And so there's a great, Jelko mentioned this, there's gonna be a steady stream of alerts for all uh, objects whose properties change between uh, Rubin Observatory exposures. Uh, how do we recognize which, which, of the, which of the millions of objects that will be flagged each night, which of those are of most uh, scientific interest for your own science area? How does one do the follow-up? There's um, sort of community-wide discussion of building uh, telescope um, um, facilities to, uh, to, to do this in a, in a coordinated way. Um, another question is, how do we as a community do the spectroscopic follow-up to do uh, to get uh, accurate spectroscopic redshifts to to characterize the, the populations of objects that we find? Um, it's a broad question about uh, which is there are a number of facilities currently under construction and uh, now underway, and I've listed some of the acronyms here um, for next generation uh, wide fields spectroscopy and the synergy with the uh, uh, Rubin is, is really uh, quite striking. And uh, of course we have two major near infrared survey facilities to, soon to be launched, uh, Euclid from the ESA and the Roman spacecraft, uh, I'm sorry, the Roman space telescope uh, from NASA. Uh, both surveys will overlap the Rubin uh, LSST and, and both are very interested in, in coordinating uh, both the technical and scientific uh, opportunities that the, the combination of the data sets will allow. And there's, so these are things for us all to be thinking about, and I think are gonna be major themes for the, the 2020s and 2030s uh, going forward. Um, I think I'm, a, I'm just about out of time. If I had more time, I would, uh, and maybe this could come up in the questions, we could talk a little bit more about things that uh, Jelko had discussed, namely the survey cadence. Um, and instead, I, I Given the time, I think I will skip that. And again, we can come up with that in the questions. But let me just um, finish up with a few thoughts here. I know that um, first, as as uh, Jelko has said, the very first light of the commissioning camera is a year away. The 10-year 10, 10 survey should start uh, roughly a year after that. And one of the themes that we constantly are amazed by is, you know, the the, the amount of science that will be done will not be limited by the quantity of data that we have, but the number of, of, of uh, ambitious scientists who, who, um, who will work with it. We will not run out of science projects to do. And, and so this is a, this is a, a data legacy that, uh, that will keep the worldwide scientific community and certainly the Brazilian uh, astronomical community busy for a very, very long time. And um, the science collaborations are doing much of the effort, but it's worth mentioning that they haven't locked this all up. There's lots of opportunity for new people to get involved, all of you, start new projects, even think about organizing new science collaborations, there's a mechanism for that. Uh, and so the 2020s will be the decade of the wide field surveys and Ruben will be leading the way. With that, uh, let me finish and ask if there are any questions. Thank you very much for another amazing talk. We do have three questions, but, but since we are uh, on time, I would invite Michael to answer them in the Q&A document. Okay. Is that okay? okay. Of course. Okay, of course. Thank, thank you very much. So let's take a break and we come back uh, at 2.30, okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
you have prevented my video. Hello, Will. Welcome. Uh, would, would you like to test your screen sharing? Sure. And my video was on, but now it says I can't run it anymore. So you've turned it off somehow. Can you try again? Yeah, it's OK now. Yeah, we can see you. No, I just got to no, find no, it. No, he, no, he, he's trying to, to play a video. No, no, yeah, my video, that's OK. And there, and now my uh, slide deck should also appear. Yeah, the, yeah. the slide deck's here. All right. OK. Now, where did everyone go? But there you are. OK. Well, there's, there's nobody with video on anyway, so. I can see the chat if there's any questions you want to put in directly during the talk. No, no worries. I'm going to read the questions if there is time. At the end, well. At the end, okay. Well, yeah. You can. Otherwise, it come... becomes becomes very complicated. <laughs> well, I'll finish on time. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's two thirty. Uh, okay. So let's resume our uh, presentations. Welcome, Dr. William Omlane from the Ruby Observatory. The floor is yours. Hi, uh, good morning. So I'm William Omlane. Um, I'm based in Tucson. And uh, in operations, I'm the Associate Director for Data Production, uh, which is uh, which I'll describe exactly what we have to do, everything to do with data and data access. Uh, about half an hour, so uh, I've got a lot of slides to get through. Um, I think you've probably seen this already from Jelco. Uh, this is the vision that we have in construction of how everything works in operations. Uh, nothing's changed in recent times, so we still believe we will take about 20 terabytes of data a night. We're going to produce pump products. I'll talk more about those later. We're going to produce data release products. I'll talk more about those as well. <laughs> Alerts will go out to the brokers uh, within about 60 seconds. And within about 24 hours, there'll be more prompt products, et cetera, coming out. And then the annual release or every six months, or, well, six months for the first one and about a year, every year after that for data releases. And our usual um, interface is going to be this uh, Ruben Science platform, uh, which I'll mention again later. And of course, we also have now a, several data centers working with us and independent data access centers, both of which I will return to at some point. And uh, questions are welcome, and I'll try to be quick to get there. So with data production, data production is almost like data management in, in construction. Um, this little chart on the right is the uh, observatory operations, data production, system performance, and education, public outreach. These are the four big departments in operations. And uh, we have to basically produce all the data products in data production. Uh, I remind people that LSE 163 is available to you. It's a public document. It is the data products definition. It tells you all of the products coming out of the observatory. Uh, we have to make sure we're making good observations. So we have to talk to the observatory operations people and system performance as well to make sure we're meeting science goals. And we have to give a certain amount of data to EPO. And obviously, if there's some very nice pictures or some wonderful success story, we will try to communicate that via EPO as well. Um, to the public in general. And of course, all during all of that time for 10 years, we we're supposed to improve the uh, hardware and software systems and keep them all running. This is uh, just to give you, um, you'll have these slides afterwards if they haven't been sent to you already. So you can look in detail. There's some names on here of who's running each of the teams within data production. Uh, also the leads of the data facilities in the UK, France, and the USA. Um, just so you have that. Uh, the uh, infrastructure team is the largest of those uh, that's based at Slack mostly, and some at Fermilab. So that's broken down into further set of groups. Again, leads are mentioned there. I think this is useful for you to have some names if you wanna know who's who or who you should contact about something. This is a good lead into that. Uh, RTN 21 is linked on this slide. That's a document that describes this structure and tells you how we're hoping to get the uh, US data facility up and running in the near future. System architecture, again, comes over from construction. So you see we have a base at La Serena. We have the observatory on the summit. We're taking down all the telemetry so that everything to do with what's happening, sensors and thermometers on the observatory, uh, as well as all the data down 
we're archiving that. Um, we're sending it to the prompt ingest, uh, and that's going to prompt processing in the states within uh, a few seconds. Um, from there, we do the alert distribution. And on the back end, we have this data backbone. So all the data files can appear at the, U at the US facility. Uh, we will also be moving them uh, over to the UK and French facility. So France has a full copy. Remember, the UK will have at least some of the data to do some of the uh, offline processing. That's not in real time. That's a little bit longer term process. And then, of course, we uh, release catalogs into QServe, which I'll mention a bit later. And again, Science Platform is the uh, access point for all of this for our science community. Uh, there's a large document, LDM148, linked on this slide, which gives you details of all of these boxes and how we hope they all fit together to give us a good operational system. Um, so yeah, we now have a US data facility. Last year, we were having a little bit of a crisis between it was going to be one place, then it was going to be some place, and now finally we know where it is. It's the uh, it's Slack. Uh, Slack, of course, we have a long history of working with true construction for the camera, so we know how they do things, and uh, we're used to working with them at the project level. Um, this will be in a shared data facility within Slack, and they will do 25% of all of the data processing. They do all their prompt processing. Um, and of course, they also do the data access for the, uh, the US community and the international community. There is a document, uh, DMTN189, which is the specification of everything that has to happen at the USDF if you're interested in those details. Then we currently have an interim data facility, which I will again come back to, where we will run pre-ops pre activities, uh, which Slack are also involved in, and the transition plan I already mentioned. Uh, the hybrid model is currently our baseline for going into operations. Uh, this is interesting and relatively new, so you may not have heard of this before. The idea is that we will keep the science platform potentially running on Google or some cloud provider outside of Slack, where all the data, the data release processing, prompt processing would still happen within Slack in the US data facility. Uh, and of course, the prompt, the, the DRP processing will also be done in France and the UK partially. Um, but the user interface would be presented and user management would all be done on a cloud platform. Uh, this gives us a separation of security concerns so we can make Slack a lot more uh, secure if we want to. Um, and we can be a little bit easier about adding users to the cloud platform because we won't have access to Slack hardware, even though data will be cached out in the background. Uh, this would also allow us to burst for data releases or for WAS meetings when everyone's trying to do their paper um, and they suddenly want access to data and we have a lot more users at peak than we would have usually. Um, and we feel this also reduces risk since we have this running quite nicely at the moment in this uh, form, at least we have everything running on, on third. Um, there's a tech note just mentioned there as well about this. Now, the, uh, the plan for getting us set up, of course, we need to get the US data facility up and running. So there's again a bunch of milestones here. Uh, we're hoping to run initial processing on our on hardware at Slack that's project owned uh, early next year. That's uh, ordered already the hardware. Of course, there's a lot of delays in supply chains at the moment. So hardware isn't arriving when we expect it, but we're still hoping to have it sometime early next year. Um, prove that that all works. And then basically towards the middle of next year be operational at the US data facility, more or less, so that we're ready to take on commissioning data in 2023. The uh, French data facility is in Lyon, so at CCI and 2P3. So again, we have a, a long history with them throughout the project. They've already been working on QServe. Uh, they already run the science platform, two, two versions of it, in fact, uh, or two deployments of it. Uh, Fabio Hernandez is the lead, um, and he is uh, meeting with us weekly, basically. And remember, they have a big amount of processing, 50% uh, of the processing to do uh, in there. And this is just a photo from the data center. Uh, the UK facility is in Edinburgh. So again, there's a, a nice building. There's nice places to visit. Um, and uh, they already have some pipelines installed. They're looking at how they can do uh, value added products with something like Vista. They're running the science platform already as well. They're also running QServe as do the French. Uh, so they're quite set up to be um, fully interoperable with what we're doing. Um, they also have Rusio and Panda expertise. 
So Panda is going to be our workflow management, most likely for operations. And Rusio will manage our file transfers between the, the uh, major data centers. Uh, George Beckett is our lead there. And again, he's on the org chart, so you can see where he fits into the picture. Underneath all of this, of course, we have networks. Um, Brazil, of course, is providing us a redundant path uh, for getting to the USA. Um, that's well appreciated. And that means we have redundant links all the way from Chile to basically the ESnet. And within ESnet, there are multiple redundant links for getting us to Slack, for example. Um, so this is all pretty much in place. We're missing a, an out-of-bounds wireless link to the summit at the moment, which we could really do with, because uh, we've had a couple of outages where that might've been handy. Uh, we've recently just got our backup link to Santiago in place in the last few months. Um, and that's, you know, the primary link there has been less than brilliant. It's failed frequently in the last year and a half. Uh, so having a backup is quite important to us on that link on that area as well. Okay, so you've seen um, actually a bigger version of something like this. this is a few arc minutes as opposed to a few tens of arc minutes, which was uh, shown by Michael. Um, this is a Sloan picture. So, you know, we've done wide image servicing surveys before. Uh, I've in fact worked on Sloan as well. This is this equivalent field in HyperSupprime Cam. So you get to begin to see. Again, Michael said it, galaxies are key. More importantly, the galaxies kind of overlay on top of everything else. And so everything becomes blended. So we have a pretty challenging job to do process these images. This image is processed with uh, our pipelines. Uh, so we are testing with these type of images already. And we're still not meeting our requirements, but we'll get there uh, soon enough. So we're, we're getting quite well on that. I think uh, for this community, you're interested in user compute. What does that mean exactly? And I wanted to point out that within the plan, there's 10% of the US compute available for uh, users. Um, this was never really well specified. What does that mean? I think in the early days, it was meant to be batch computing. Uh, we didn't have the notion of a science platform where you could run a notebook. Uh, so in fact, that has to be part of that 10%. It's built into the sizing model. So again, DMTN 135 tells you how we work out the sizes for everything. Uh, we're beginning to look a little bit more at what this means precisely. And DMTN 202, I think is one of the interesting documents again for, especially for users external. This is the kind of use cases we think we should try to support. Uh, we're not sure what we can do. So next thing we have to do is figure out what's, what's in construction and what we're gonna end up having to try and do as we enter into operations. Uh, I will also point out 10% isn't that much. Uh, if lots of people on the science platform, you could use up that 10%, well, you know, reasonably quickly. Um, it's enough definitely for that, for giving everyone, say, a, pro, uh, a core. Uh, it's not enough to give everyone a thousand cores. So you'll have some sort of time allocation committee for big, bigger branch processes, uh, which will be set up in operations. Just mentioning the science, plat the, uh, science pipelines, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of code. Uh, well over a million lines, million and a half or so at the moment. Uh, it's a combination of uh, C++ and Python. There's some JavaScript and Java in there and Kotlin, uh, but basically underlying there is C++ and Python uh, is used basically for almost everything else. If you look at this plot on the right, you can see that in fact, over the last few years, since about 2017, almost everything has been in Python and the C++ has pretty much been in maintenance. Um, so that's uh, you know good that we're basically adding quickly functionality using Python tools and libraries. A um, couple of notes are mentioned here that are of interest. Again, crowded field photometry, where we are at the moment, DMTN 129, and de-blending DMTN 38. Then, uh, so I presume Chelko also mentioned something along these lines. I'm sorry, I wasn't here earlier. I'm, I'm, in a, in a review at the moment. So I'm just stepping out to give the talk. Um, I think things are changing a little bit. The way we look at how people do science with astronomy through archives, as opposed to observer driven proposals. And obviously on Sloan, we have no observer driven proposals. You can't request a specific observation, but Hey, good news. It was made anyway, because we're going to see everything eventually, um, across the Southern hemisphere. And uh, I worked previously on Gaia. It's the same story with Gaia. Gaia is a spinning satellite. It's surveying the, the sky. You can't ask it to do something specific. 
Um, but you will get data from everything because it will see everything eventually. Uh, we are sized, again, coming back to that 10%, was something along 10, five times the number of Sloan users. Uh, it could be more than that. Um, and the science platform is a little bit different way of working. I think the principle is we need to work hard on how to bring users to this data through the archive, uh, since that's the interface for getting all of your science out. And that is the science platform. Uh, our notion here is basically to bring users onto a, um, a notebook aspect, a portal aspect, or through a web API if you really want to write something uh, directly, or if you want to use something like Topcat, uh, where you just want to do a query and you want to plot it in Topcat, you could do that directly through, through, through basically VO tools that exist. Um, we will provide these uh, this portal for big visualizations and a notebook aspect, which I think at these days, everybody's pretty much familiar with. It's Jupyter Lab uh, with our stack completely built in so that you could ask access and reprocess an image. Uh, you could step through the pipeline, you could modify things and play with specific image processing for a given CCD, for example. Uh, I think this is very powerful. The main idea here is we want people, we want to bring people to all of our petabytes of data. We do not want people downloading petabytes of data. Uh, so again, I think this enables science discovery. Uh, it lets you bring your own user environment. We do have a lot of things installed. You can install other tools yourself, which is very nice. Uh, and again, I think most people understand this at this point in time. It was very novel a few years ago, and now everybody's doing it. So prompt products are the uh, the thing, the first of our products that, that will be produced. Um, this is the 60 seconds, if you want, uh, alerts. And then over a slightly longer period, the, re the, uh, the processed images that we did each night, the difference images and catalogs from those specific images. Uh, and when we have templates for everything, we will be producing a lot of alerts. We reckon uh, 10 million transients per night. That's a lot of information for people to digest. Uh, we'll send that out to a series of community brokers. Those are up and running or starting to get up and running at the moment. Each of those are usually they're concentrating on a specific area of science, trying to bring that data set down uh, and categorize it for people a little bit more. So that's going to be quite interesting to see how all that functions in the future. And then the catalogs, as I said, about uh, 24 terabytes a year coming up. Then the data release products, that's on a slightly longer time scale where we will reprocess all of the data. Uh, we think that by the time we get to the end, when we reprocess everything, we're going to use about 450 million core hours of processing time to produce about 300 petabytes of data. It's a rather large data set. Uh, we have about six months of wall clock time in our plan to do that each year. It grows each year. We will buy more computers as we go further into the processing um, chain uh, time uh, uh, so that we keep the processing around about the same wall clock time. Um, again, if you want those products, I mentioned the document before, the DPDD, that you can look at seeing what all those products are. Like one of the most interesting products are catalogs. Uh, those reprocessing will produce all of the catalogs. Um, and those are pretty big. So 60 tera rows, for example, are about 10 petabytes for the uh, final data release. That's a lot of objects. And most of the relational databases do not manage that level of uh, data, uh, number of rows. Um, and we are supposed to produce uh, you know, we're supposed to answer queries on very small areas in under a few seconds, scan the full object table in an hour or so um, for lots of users, and do deeper analysis with joins uh, over about eight hours. So this has all been taken into account, and uh, this QServe has been built. Sorry, my slide is not advancing. Um, not sure if it's advancing on your side. Mine is stuck. Uh, anyway, QServe is a, a massively shared, nothing, massively parallel processing system. It's based on SQL underneath. It's a, it's an, a relational database. It has spatial partitioning, um, shared scans that allow us to basically answer multiple user queries simultaneously with a small delay, because we will basically wait for a bunch of queries before we run them all together. So we access all the data once. Uh, we have tested this. It looks quite promising and looks like it's going to uh, meet the requirements uh, for a data release one for sure to be able to, to do those queries in the kind of time specified on slide 20. 
and I uh, now I'm going to have to stop because I cannot yeah. advance my slides. <laughs> yeah, we, oh. we see slide 20. Yep. How, I'm how about restarting, Will? Yeah, I'm going to have to restart my, uh, uh, let me unshare and reshare and see if yeah. I can come back. Almost there. If you want, I can share. I have, if you haven't changed your talk, I have a. Uh, that may have to be done since it's not appearing for me. Okay, so I'll share my screen. You can go straight to slide 21. Okay, just a second. If mine pops up in the meantime, I will share it, but it's not looking very promising. Can you see it? Yeah. So let me. Okay. I may have made small changes, but it's nothing that serious. Um, okay. Uh, I just said all of this while my screen went blank. So I think there's a couple of documents linked here uh, also about uh, um, testing with BigQuery, for example, against BigQuery and the most recent scaling tests of DMT or 71. So feel free to click through on those. And uh, next slide. All right. Um, so interim data facility, I mentioned this already. Uh, we, we did a, a tender with uh, cloud providers and chose Google to host a full up data facility for three years to uh, bring us from pre-operations into operations. Uh, we started that in October of 2020. Uh, June of 2021, we did data preview 0.1, uh, giving the first few hundred users access to the science platform on Google, accessing uh, simulated data from uh, Data Challenge 2 of Desk, which I know was mentioned earlier uh, by both Chelko and Michael. Uh, so we're using that data set also to expose people to the science platform. Uh, we're running services uh, at some level of scale. We need to scale up some more. Of course, we have the opportunity to do that on Google, so that's quite interesting. Uh, next slide. So I would like to get to the end and get some few minutes. Uh, I think I don't want to go into that in detail. You can just see the architecture on Google, how this works, uh, some of the same things I mentioned above. Uh, we haven't obviously done anything with prompt processing on there yet, although we did in a previous study. Uh, and so basically it's Jupyter Notebooks and Visualization Portal at the moment and the QServe database are all running uh, up on the cloud and users are accessing that. So next, uh, data preview 0 0.1, I mentioned in June, it's a pre-ops activity. Uh, you can click on the link data.sst.cloud. If you're not part of the, uh, the cohort, you cannot access it further than the front page, but it's a nice front page and you can see that it's real. You can, I think, access the documentation, which is also linked there, dp0-1.lsst.io, give you an idea of the kind of documentation we think we're going to be producing with data releases, including support and documentation for tools. Um, okay, and next one, I think, is dp0.2. Uh, so here, as I said, we're going to reprocess all of that desk data uh, sometime during uh, 2022. So by, by June of 2022, it should be reprocessed and published again We'll take on a few, another hundred or a few hundred users extra onto the science platform. So we'll go up, uh, you know, double the number of users. 
Um, this will be version 23 of the pipelines, uh, which you can find soon released. Uh, we're on release candidate five of that at the moment. So that's going to be uh, probably uh, released in January or December. Um, we're going to run the pipelines a little bit differently to the way we've been doing them previously. We're not going to run each patch to the end. We're going to run one step completely. So a single frame processing, for example, uh, and then the next step, and then do the combinations, et cetera, after that. Uh, this is all running with Panda on the, um, on the cloud. And we will try later in the year to also do some split of processing between the French, uh, French UK and uh, US data facilities. So next slide. And we're getting close to, and so yeah, just to mention community engagement, it's quite important for data preview zero. Uh, there were um, a lot of people, uh, well, sort of 250 delegates, the, the community engagement team ran uh, delegate assemblies every couple of weeks. There we went through specific notebooks with people, let them ask questions. And then towards the, after a few months, the delegates started presenting their notebooks and interesting things they'd done. Uh, so it was quite good. The feedback was very interesting um, and very supportive. The community in general liked it. Um, and so we find that positive and we got some feedback for, for you know, improvements, especially towards documentation. Um, okay, then next, uh, yeah, communitylssd.org mentioned on there as well. Of course, you can access that. It's a public forum. Um, again, of interest here, I think the in-kind uh, computational resources, one of the biggest ones, which is DAC. I've mentioned the UK and the UF processing, uh, UK and French uh, processing facilities. Those are already um, up and running. Um, there's also independent data access centers. These will take some subset of the data and usually serve specific science case and potentially add value add onto that some local data set and make it available alongside Ruben data, which is also quite interesting. Um, and then there may be at least one science scientific processing center, which intends to provide some high performance computing alongside the data for people to do specific science cases as well. Uh, I think the next few slides uh, we can go through quickly. Uh, okay, well, challenges of, of IDAX. So from my perspective of construction manager for data production, uh, I look at this IDAX popping up going, ooh, how am I going to manage authentication? How am I going to get them data transfers? None of this was in the original plan when we set up uh, Ruben. So we've now got some things that we have to do extra. Okay. We'll figure out a way of doing that, but it's something to be conscious of as you are an IDAC, uh, if you're setting it up that, you know, there are constraints on the construction side and bandwidth constraints that we have to look after as well. Uh, but connecting communities should be really good. Uh, the next ones, I think we can just go through them. I think they're good to note. These are the different IDACs. Uh, they've, it's their words. These are their slides from a meeting we had previously. I think it's interesting um, how they phrased it. And I think that gets us to the conclusion. Um, so, you know, data production will pick up pretty much seamlessly from data management. Uh, we do have some, some work still to do, obviously. I think it's a good demonstration with DP0 um, and we're showing the DRP run at DP0.2 and we're working on with Slack and the French and the UK. We're meeting every week, trying to set up data facilities to make sure the processing is going to work seamlessly when we get to operations. And uh, the IDAX look interesting. Um, you know, okay, I'm, I'm a little worried what's going to happen with them, but they look very interesting and they could be a good good boost to science and that's always fantastic. And we're looking forward to Ruben data and operations. And I think the last slide just says questions. Has a nice picture of a of the original blast site and the, the mountain as it is today. So in July, yeah, it was pretty. Okay, so I think I left at least a couple of minutes for questions if there was some in the chat. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Will, for the presentation. And thank you, Luis, for, for passing the slides. I'm giving you back at the control, okay? I'm All stopping right. here. Okay, I don't see any questions in our document. All right. Uh, then you've got a few extra minutes on your agenda, even better. Yeah, and, and we, also, we also have uh, uh, the other uh, speakers online. If there's someone would like to make a question, to ask a question, please just unmute and, and then we can pass the floor to Dr. Jeno Sokolowski.
from uh, the University of Columbia and LSST Corporation. Okay, we can see your slides. Great, thank you. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thanks, hi everyone. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today and adding to what has already been presented from representatives of the um, Federal Construction Project and the scientific community. Oops, ah, here we go. So you've heard, you might've heard people refer to the LSST ecosystem. You've heard about a lot of different entities. And so I wanna start by mentioning where LSST Corporation fits within this ecosystem of organizations that is designed to help get science out of Rubin LSST. So there's the federally funded construction project. There are um, the organization of science collaborations that Michael mentioned there with thousands of astronomers included. And we are, I'm here representing LSST Corporation, which um, is a nonprofit organization whose members are not individual scientists, but um, institutions or consortia of institutions. And so those of you who whose institutions participate in Linnea, um, forgive me if I'm pronouncing that acronym incorrectly, are members of LSST Corporation. So we're a nonprofit and the goal of this nonprofit is in my own words, to maximize the scientific output and societal impact of Rubin LSST. So I don't expect you to read all the text on this slide. This is just a list of the various institutions that are members of this nonprofit organization, LSST Corporation. And I've circled some of the organizations, I think most of the ones that are, inter that are outside the United States. So you can see that we are a international organization, although we're based in Tucson, Arizona in the US, there are quite a few, and I would say even a growing number of international members. And uh, that connects to part of our goal, which is to maximize the scientific output and of uh, Rubin LSST. And of course we do that by involving the international com community and helping people collaborate. Okay, so how do we pursue this mission specifically? We create programs that um, we solicit funding from private sources typically to create and then run programs that will help the scientific community. And we also advocate for the scientific users of Rubin LSST when that is needed. So you might be familiar with some of our programs that have been running for quite a while, I think at least six years for some of these programs. Some are student focused. So there's the data science fellowship program, which is a supplementary data science education program for graduate students. That was, I think started about six years ago and is a highly sought after program and very successful complement to traditional graduate education in astrophysics. Um, we also have a few programs, mostly before the pandemic for undergraduate students, which helped provide travel funds so that students who had done some work related to preparing for Rubin LSST could meet other such students, come to the annual project and community workshop and present their work in a poster and meet uh, in posters and meet other scientists. Um, I think that was paused briefly because of the pandemic, but these are the kind of things that we like to do to help students um, participate in preparing for LSST. And all of these programs that I'll mention, um, usually researchers and students from member institutions, they're, they're generally open to all researchers and students with some priority access to researchers and students from LSSTC member institutions or consortia such as Linnea. In addition to focusing on students, we've been running some smaller programs that, um, help provide some structure and funding for um, professional researchers preparing for LSST. So at this point, I think we've funded more than 75 small projects and a typical project would be a meeting. So maybe providing the equivalent of $10,000 to an organization to bring um, people together to 
address some aspect of Ellis's T science. Um, we have been a, a key source of support for the science collaborations as they seek to prepare for Ruben Ellis's T science and uh, have basically supported a, a very a variety of types of small programs. What I want to talk to you about today is our recent success in going beyond this level of small programming for the scientific community, as we have recently launched a much larger multi-million dollar endeavor that has several parts. And two of the parts that are um, that were launched in this past year, well, first of all, let me just say this endeavor is called LINK or the full uh, name is the LSSTC Interdisciplinary Network for Collaboration and Computing. You don't need to worry about that, um, but I might refer to the link um, in the next few slides. And that is this umbrella project that has several parts um, and is intended to serve the entire astrophysics community. So this includes a postdoctoral fellowship program, a new program to help lead the development of analysis software for Ruben Analysis T, and that's analysis software beyond what's being provided by the project. So the user generated to help users create their own tools and share tools and assess their own tools. Um, and uh, some incubators to allow researchers to visit organizations that are leading the effort to develop these software, the software infrastructure. Um, this, the set of programs is administered through LSSTC, as I said, or is based in Tucson, Arizona, but also is being led through a few of our member institutions currently. Um, the two institutions that are leading the effort in the development of analysis software beyond what's being provided by the project are Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Washington. Um, also involved are University of Arizona and Northwestern. And we will seek as time passes to expand that group of organizations that are playing a lead role in helping us run this set of programs. So now in the next couple of slides, I wanna dive down a little bit deeper into these two big programs that we've just launched in this past year. The first one is called Link Frameworks. And uh, if you miss anything that I've that I um, said today um, afterwards, or you decide that you want more information, you can find everything that I'm going to cover today on the LSST Corporation website. If you go to that website, there's a series of tabs. One is link, and under that, there's some menu options. One of those is link frameworks, which is the analysis software development program. And another is called the LSSTC Catalyst Fellowship. And so you can go and there's a lot of information there if you're interested. So just a brief overview about LINK Frameworks, which is again, the part of LINK that is um, going to, that is funded by a private foundation called the Schmidt Futures Foundation. And they will be, we will be working with researchers at Carnegie Mellon and Washington and throughout the community to develop um, some software infrastructure focused initially on three topics, which I've written here, a framework for solar system science, a framework for time domain science, and a framework for extra galactic science there with a focus on photometric redshifts and uh, comparing different algorithms and helping people de develop um, uh, their own methodologies. So in addition to creating this software, there in the near future, we will be running several uh, workshops, several community engagement programs so that the community can have a voice in what's being created and also have a role in testing and beta testing some of these um, software, these platforms. So coming up, we'll have our first design workshop. An announcement will, I think, come out next week for the first design workshop, technical design workshop um, in March of 2022. And then in the following year, we will be inviting, um, I think six teams 
to receive, to apply, to come to visit Carnegie Mellon or Washington and spend some time there as in an incubator situation, really being some very early testers and users of this software. And each will be provided with some funds to make that trip and to support them while they're there. And then throughout this, the duration of the project as it currently stands is about five years. We'll be running some hack weeks for broader groups from the community to come and uh, to various sites, different LSSTC member institutions and have a go at using some of the analysis tools that'll be produced through LINK. Um, and I should also mention that we're, although we are a nonprofit, LSSTC is a nonprofit organization that is not officially connected to the, the Rubin Observatory project in an official way, we work closely with them and uh, communicate and coordinate so that um, as Link does create some software, we intend to make this um, easy to access for the users. So that if you go to, for example, the Noir Labs portal to access anything related to Ruben, you'll be able to access these software tools and it won't be completely disjointed separate systems. Um, although that is all to be finalized, this is all just beginning to be developed. Okay, the second big part of LINK that we launched in the past year is called the LSSTC Catalyst Fellowship, and it's funded by the John Templeton Foundation. So some of you maybe even applied. We just ran our first um, call for applications. The deadline was November 15th, and this is a new fellowship akin to other top uh, fellowships. You know, our goal is to make it as um, competitive as like the Hubble Fellowship, but um, with, I think, even better with some more features that make it very desirable for participants. So fellows will have academic freedom, a competitive stipend, and all the things you expect from a fellowship. We in, have funding for at least the first two cohorts and a good line for future funding for five fellows per year in astrophysics. and. These fellows will have a wide choice of host institutions. They can sit at any LSSTC member institution in general. And um, from the perspective of someone who's not an applicant, but an LSSTC member institution, um, you can. this is a way where you might have a fully funded fellow, a postdoctoral fellow working on LSST related research, get funded to come do their research at your institution and work with your local researchers, faculty, and students. Um, and I can just say, since we just run, ran our first process, um, or we're just in the process, we just ran our first set of applications, and uh, we're in the, in the midst of that process, that um, it seems that it's advantageous, if you're interested in having people apply to come to your institution, to do recruitment um, by word of mouth, talk to uh, early career researchers that you think um, you'd like to have come do work at your institution and encourage them to apply. Um, we'll have our next round next year, but encourage them to come apply for one of these fellowships and uh, maybe they'll be able to come to your institution. Some things that are special about this fellowship that are a little different than some of the standard Astro fellowships are that this one is cross-disciplinary. And by that, I mean more than just in the way Rubin Observatory itself and LSST is cross-disciplinary. You know, there you have astrophysics, um, computer science, high energy particle physics, a lot of people working together, data science. Um, we're actually working with social scientists, so really spanning a range of disciplines um, and having, we are, have recently called for applications for the Astro Fellows, but we will also fund some social science fellows. And we have a team of social scientists working with us and they'll be doing active research on the practice of science and using the LSST ecosystem as this is their data set. So we'll be looking at LSST data of the site, the data um, of the, in the sky, and they will be looking at us and also um, researching how, to do big science, how to do big um, big science and such large collaborations and what with so much data, how to make it inclusive, what works, um, and there will be the opportunity for anyone working with involved in Link and especially the Catalyst Fellows to collaborate with any of these um, social scientists who are investigating the practice of science as um, focused on Ruben LSST. 
some other kind of unusual aspects of our postdoc fellowship that we just launched is it does have a connection. As I said, it has a connection to Link. Not only is it a part of Link, but a subset of fellows who apply to sit at these specific institutions that are leading some of the software development effort um, for the high level analysis software will have um, can apply for four year terms. And we did get some applicants applying for such positions in the most recent round. And those applicants can uh, spend some of their time working on analysis tools. And our goal with creating this option for fellows is that they can um, be involved in software development and also have time to do that and publish so that they'll be in a very good position when they look to move to their next career step stage and they won't be penalized, for example, if they spent a significant amount of time testing or working on software, they still will have the publication record. So to set them up to do well in their careers. Um, the fellowship will also include some structured mentorship and leadership training, right, to, trying to create the next generation of leaders for big survey science. Um, and as part of that, again, since we generally work with private funding instead of U.S. government funding, we can do things a little bit differently. Sometimes we have a little more freedom at LSSTC in the way we structure our programs and allocate funding. So in this case, each uh, fellow will put together a collaboration and mentoring committee, and there is some funding available for some of those mentors as well, so that they can devote significant time to supporting the efforts of these fellows. Um, also to connect to what Will was saying earlier about the delegates and the delegates for the data previews, the fellows will be um, granted automatic delegate status. And I thank Bob Blum for agreeing to that um, very kind offer, which will help our fellows very much. So just to summarize, LSSTC, as I hope you heard, is a member-based nonprofit, and our mission is to really help you, to help maximize the scientific output and the societal impact of Rubin LSST. And um, for those from member institutions and even the broader community, we are interested in your voice. Our members help shape our programs. These decisions that we make, made to focus on say the development of analysis software and um, postdoc fellowships, that came from our members. Those were priorities that our members supported and in fact participated on task forces to help us design these programs and to help get them started. So we work directly, um, we direct work to direct private philanthropy to programs that help the community. And as I said, we've just launched our biggest and most ambitious set of programs. Um, and if you're from an organization, an institution that's not yet a member, I think uh, encourage you to look into joining LSSTC and there are many member, member uh, benefits to doing so, um, like increased access to our programs, a voice in shaping those programs and engagement for your whole department in the excitement of Ruben LSST. I'll take any questions if there are. Me. Thank you very much, Jeno. Uh, yeah, we do have one. Uh, it's not a question, it's more a comment from mm -hmm. Christina Chiappini. Thank you for this talk. Maybe it would be worth making some links to the OWSD, the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World, uh, which is particularly interested in equity inclusion in science. That's, um, thank you for that comment. We have a task force that is, um, you know, our, we are very, very interested in inclusivity in our programs. And we even have a task force we've set up that is trying to identify such organi organizations to partner with and to reach out to. So I've written this one down and I appreciate that comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think we can move on to our last speaker, Dr. Lauren Cordes. Hello, Lauren. Uh, can you share your slides? Hello, yes, I will bring them up now. Okay, let me present. Great. Great. So you can see them? Okay. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you all today. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and so I'm going to present to you a different part of the construction project, which is the education and public outreach program. So I wanna go over who we are, um, what we're trying to do, uh, how we're trying to do it. And at the end, also talk a bit about how you all can get involved in our program in the near future. Um, so the first thing to point out is that EPO is part of the construction project. Um, so the same way Telescope Insight, Camera and Data Management are subsystems of the construction project, uh, so is education and public outreach. Um, and so we've been working you know, for the past however many years to build out this really exciting program that I'm going to share with you today. Um, so our mission is to provide online data-driven experiences that are accessible and approachable, adding real-world context and opportunities for people to engage with Rubin Observatory and explore the universe. Um, so I'm gonna go through uh, what that means to us, uh, who we're trying to serve and what we've been building to achieve this mission. So our approach to EPO is really uh, uh, locked up in these few uh, phrases here. So first, we're trying to make sure that our program is accessible, by which we mean we're designing our, all of our materials specifically for the general public. So we're not taking tools that were meant for researchers who are doing academic professional research and just giving those to the public. We're really thinking about what is a member who doesn't have all of that background interested in learning and how can we support them in exploring Rubin discoveries. So we're building widgets, online interactions um, that are intuitive and non-intimidating uh, that get people directly to the data and that sense of discovery. We're also trying to make sure what we're building is interesting, which seems obvious, but what we mean by that is that we're trying to provide narratives so the data has context and meaning relevant to general experiences. If you don't have years of background and understanding ast astronomy concepts, then exactly what's so exciting about Rubin is maybe not so obvious to you. So that's what we're working on. So we're going to create news about exciting discoveries. We're curating the alert stream and also the data. So in order to be able to present narratives to the public. Uh, and in particular, we're also interested in focusing on the people of Rubin Observatory, who actually makes this project possible. We're also working on making our program engaging, um, by which we mean uh, promoting this interactivity, encouraging the discovery of new ideas and interactions instead of just always reading about things online. So that's part of our programs like citizen science, making sure everything is shareable with your friends and family, videos, et cetera. And finally, we were really interested in making sure that our program was capable of reaching a large audience. Um, so instead of focusing on local in-person engagement, which is hugely important and highly impactful, we decided that instead we wanted to have as large of audience as possible and put our program entirely online. So to be able to access the Rubin EPO program, all you need really is a cell phone with some basic internet connection. Um, and that's going to be true for all of our materials, the website, um, the interactives I'll show you, and also the classroom education program that we're developing. So who is EPO trying to reach? Um, so this is where we're different from the other subsystems. Instead of reaching out to the scientific community, we're interested in addressing these four audiences. Um, so the broadest and biggest by far is the science interested general public. Uh, so we're building a website and other interaction and interactive tools for that audience. We're also interested in reaching formal educators, by which we mean teachers in classrooms, teaching to curricula with students. We're also looking to reach citizen science principal investigators. So all of you who might be interested in starting a citizen science project. And finally, people who are at uh, science centers and other content creators who might be interested in sharing Ruben. And so what you'll see is a lot of those audiences are focused on people who then in turn can help us reach even larger audiences. So by helping teachers, we're also reaching all of their students. By helping principal investigators and citizen science projects, we're reaching all the people who will participate in their projects. And same with the science centers and content creators, anyone who comes to them looking for stories and information about the universe will be able to interact with Ruben. So I'm going to go through our program that we're building for each of these audiences, just to sort of summarize what are the tools that we're hoping to make available soon. And I'm gonna start with the science interested general public. So the biggest thing that we're building for the public is our website. It's an entirely online program. People are going to want to go to the website to find all of the things that we're building. So this website for the project and operations is going to host all content relevant to the general public. And in particular, it's designed to be inclusive of all users. And by inclusivity here, what we mean is um, 
physically inclusive of anyone trying to access something on the internet. So making sure that being sighted isn't a requirement to be able to use our materials online or being able to use a mouse to click on things. So any form of device that you're using to get online is something that we'll be supporting. The website is going to feature all of the different things that I'm going to mention throughout the rest of this talk, in addition to other news stories, profiles of people on of uh, profiles of the Rubin staff, interactive, engaging, embeddable things that we're hoping people will want to share. Uh, and finally, to make the point is that um, scientists are going to get directed to other websites. So we'll feature basic information about the observatory here, what it's doing, what are the technologies, but for really technical information related to the survey itself or seeing conditions or anything related to the software, um, that's going to be resources maintained by the Rubin community engagement team. And that was an active decision so that when any person comes to the website, they feel included and not turned off by information that's too technical for them. A big tool that we're building is something we're calling the Sky Viewer. Um, and we've designed it out and we've built a prototype. And so that's what's going to be playing on the right that I'll try and talk through as it's going. Um, so the goal of this tool is to provide a fun, intuitive way for the public to explore Rubin discoveries. And in particular, for them to be able to see the entire all sky, all Southern sky survey that we're going to be producing. Um, so in a, different than the types of tools that are being provided by DM to scientists, this is really focusing on interactions that the public will be interested in. So you'll see that there are objects that are pre-selected for people to click on. They can still pan and zoom around and get a sense of the scale of the survey and how things are related to each other. We're providing technical information, but we're also providing things like unique characteristics of objects, things that people would want to know about them. And we're also providing the ability to filter and sort objects using words that are more familiar to people, like the type of object or how far things might be, as opposed to requiring them, say, to enter an RA and deck position to be able to see an object. But it's also going through now as we're providing uh, tours. So say you open a tool like this and you have no idea what you're supposed to be able to do. We have some examples of different kinds of objects you can look at in a narrative that collects them, that, that connects them. Next. And so the Sky Viewer is a particularly advanced interactive tool, but we're building a series of uh, simpler browser based tools that will enable people to directly interact with the data. Um, and they're designed around interactions that are familiar to people who are already online. So things like what was being shown here in this video, people have already plotted these points in this example. And now you can just draw a line to fit and it gives you some numerical information about the relationship that you just drew as well. So you don't need to be able to code or anything like that. All you need to be able to do is open up your browser and use the tools. And the goal of this really is to use it right now specifically in our classroom activities, but also throughout the website in general. So that anytime we're presenting a new discovery or a new story about Ruben, we can take what's normally a passive experience, just reading an article or looking at a picture, and transforming it into an interactive one where people can actually explore the data that's being discussed that led to that discovery that people themselves are interested in. Okay, so that's most of our tools for the general public. What about for educators and people in the classroom? So the goal of our education program is to use these same sorts of intuitive interactive tools to bring real data into typical classrooms. And so our focus here is on advanced middle school, high school, and introductory college students. Uh, so in the US, that means students anywhere from around the age of say 12 up to 18 or 19 when they're entering university and taking you know, intro to astronomy. All of the investigations, the classroom materials are de designed with a progression of concepts so that we take the students from some starting point and make sure that we're guiding them to the eventual learning outcome that we're interested in. And each of these activities are designed to take roughly one to two hours so that they can fit in an average classroom period. And a big goal for us is that they should be usable by anyone. So you don't need an astronomer required to be present to use these materials. You don't really even need that strong of an astronomy background. So we recognize that particularly in the US, a lot of teachers who are maybe teaching intro to astronomy have some background in science, but not astronomy in particular. Um, and so we provide a whole bunch of uh, support materials for teachers that way they can feel confident using these in their classrooms. And in particular, as I mentioned, everything is based in the browser. You don't need to download data. You don't need to download software. All you need to be able to do is open up a web page. And finally, a big part of what we've been doing is user testing all these materials, putting them in front of real teachers and real students to understand where do these work? 
where do these not work, and to make revisions so that when we launch the program, we're really confident that this is going to be successful. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the formal education program is not just these classroom activities themselves, but it's a whole suite of materials that are designed to support teachers. So teacher guides, some assessment or testing ideas, um, standards that they'll have to teach to that are required by their local governments. Uh, it's all on the website. And we're also providing professional development or training for educators on how to use these materials. If you're interested in looking at some of these interactions that we've designed for students yourself, you can go to this link. It'll also be on my last side. I can also provide it again at the end of this talk. Um, but it's really fun to go in. They're a little bit out of context, each of these interactions. Normally they're meant to exist within a one hour activity. Um, but if you have the background, it's easy to go in and you know, find the supernova, draw the line and explore them for yourself. Moving on to citizen science and citizen science PIs. Early on, our team made the decision that instead of EPO deciding to lead a handful of citizen science projects ourselves, that a much better use of our time and a much better use of the huge scale of Rubin data would be to enable any Rubin scientist to be able to go in and create a citizen science project that they were interested. And so that's what we're doing. We've partnered with the Zooniverse, um, which is a well-known site for these types of citizen science projects. And what we're building is infrastructure and a pipeline so that any person can go into the Rubin Science platform, identify which data that they would like to put into a citizen science project, and send that directly to the Zooniverse to be able to build out a citizen science project on their website. And so this is really going to enable citizen science on the scale of Rubin. So right now, what you would have to do is download your data and re-upload it. We're skipping that whole step because there's just going to be too much Rubin data for that to be feasible. And so we're working closely with the Rubin Community Engagement Team, which you've heard about, and the Zooniverse to be able to coordinate support, develop these services, and really make sure that anyone who wants to do citizen science with Rubin data is going to be supported. And then finally, for informal science centers and content creators, uh, we're creating a whole suite of free multimedia that can be used by anyone in any way looking to communicate Rubin science. So at the moment, we've created a set of 20 short uh, planetarium fo format video clips that feature a range of astronomical concepts that are associated with Rubin. We're also working on creating videos that we're gonna put on YouTube that promote Rubin and explain its science and technologies. We're expecting to have four by the end of construction and we're going to continue to create these as we move into operations. And finally, um, when we launch our website, we're going to have a gallery of photos and graphics um, that are all going to be available for people to use. So what is our timeline? That's what we've been building over these last few years. And so at the moment, EPO is in its final year of the construction project. Um, so we're wrapping all this up, we're building all this infrastructure, we're so close to having it all done. And so for this year, we're going to continue user testing, continue building, reviewing our materials. And then in August, 2022, there's the project community workshop where members of the project and the scientific community tend to come together to talk about all things related to Rubin where we're going to celebrate the completion of the EPO program. And then in October, 2022, we are launching into operations. So we're going to launch the public website. We're going to start rolling out this education program. The multimedia materials will be available to everyone. And then we are going to move into operations as a team. So this is ahead of the rest of the construction project. EPO is going to finish in less than a year. So how can the scientific community get involved in what we're doing? Um, right now, uh, the science collaborations have EPO liaisons who we first reach out to, um, but we're starting to expand that. As we get closer and closer to operations, we're looking for more and more participation in what we're doing. Uh, so we also have a survey available to help us try and build a network of scientists who are interested in EPO. So if any of this sounds interested to you and you want to be kept up to date on things, fill out that survey. Um, I'd also recommend making sure you're on community.lsst.org. We'll be posting things there uh, and in our EPO Slack channel. We also just have launched a review of our educational investigations. Um, so that program that I mentioned is really broad. It's also trying to address all Rubin science topics. Um, and we at EPO are very confident and very proud of what we built, but we also recognize that we are not experts in every field of science that Rubin is participating in. Um, so we're seeking expertise in the community to help us review these materials and to feel really confident in launching them to the public. And so that's that second link there. 
And then finally, the easiest thing that you can do is just join in on the conversation on social media. So we're ramping up our social media presence and really trying to engage with the public and with the community more actively. And so you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the places you would expect us to be. And then as we continue to move into operations, we at EPO are really aware that astronomers, the scientific community, are going to be who inspires all of our new content for the programs that we're building. Um, and so we're definitely going to be looking for participation to be able to share the science that you all are doing with the public. And so there's a variety of forms that that can take from suggesting visuals or graphics, um, coming to us with new results that you think would be great for press releases or to share with the public, providing data sets for all of these tools. Um, that way people can actually you know, play with the data and be part of that discovery process creating citizen science projects, receiving communications training, or even using the educational program in your classrooms. So we're going to be building out all of these types of ways of participating in EPO in the next year and beyond. And we definitely welcome recommendations for how EPO can best facilitate these relationships. And so that's where we are, what we're building, who we are, what we're building, and how we're expecting to be able to launch our program in the future. So at the top here, I've left the survey if you'd like to um, contribute your name to people who are interested in EPO, as well as the link to those interactive experiences if you'd like to try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, I do have one question. I don't see any questions yet. We, we still have a little bit of a delay uh, from YouTube, but it can uh, appear a question, but I do have a question. Uh, will the EPO apps and tools be available to be used in classrooms worldwide for free, even for those private uh, educational institutions? Yeah, that's right. So our program is going to be world public. Um, and at the moment, it's slated to be available in English and Spanish. But yeah, there'll be no limitations on who's going to be able to use the, use the program. Okay. So I don't see any questions anymore. So I thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just go to share my screen again to, to just say a, a couple of words for, for the final remarks. So again, thank you very much for all uh, the participants, all the people that are watching us uh, on YouTube and special thanks to all the presenters and the sponsors. Uh, if you are watching us uh, on YouTube, uh, please stay tuned tomorrow. Tomorrow, the presentations will be in Portuguese, and we are going to focus on the Brazilian participation, the science that is already being done by the Brazilian groups, and about the new opportunities for early next year. So if you'd like to know how to get involved, please come back tomorrow. And for more information about everything uh, we already said and more, you can visit Linear's website and check out our social media. Thank you very much.